that is Sela Nevo from Google that will talk about progresses and challenges in uh, high accuracy flood forecasting on global scales, which is quite an intriguing title. So we are really looking forward for your presentation, Sela. If you would like to try to share your screen and steal the screen, I mean, to Irving, please proceed. Sure. Thank you, Roberto. And I, let's see if this is working. Can you, can you see my screen now? Perfect. Excellent. So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sela, and I lead the Google Flood Forecasting Initiative. The goal of this effort is to use Google's data, computational resources, and machine learning expertise to empower governments and other organizations to provide accurate and actionable flood alerts globally. Our focus is currently on riverine floods, as opposed to flash floods or coastal floods. And today I want to talk about the challenges in scaling riverine flood forecasting systems to a global scale, uh, while retaining the accuracy and actionability of high-end systems and also discuss some of our recent progress towards uh, that goal of high accuracy uh, global flood forecasting systems. I wanna focus on three important components of such a system. The first will be the hydrologic model, the second will be the inundation model, and then the third component will be the warning distribution at the end. Let's dive straight into the first one. The hydrologic model, as I assume many of you knows, accepts various inputs, including precipitation, soil moisture, soil radiance, and more, and produces as an output a forecast for either discharge or sometimes even water level throughout the river. And the classic approach for these kinds of models is that each component uh, represents a separate uh, physical process. Uh, and while in practice, we don't have nearly enough information to kind of actually define the forcing data to implement full physics-based models, we use simplistic conceptual models uh, that approximate them. Now, this methodology, which has today ever since the, uh, at least the models we're using today, many of them existed since the 70s, um, has several uh, disadvantages, several downsides, right? One is that despite being relatively complex from a human standpoint, they're relatively simplistic relative to the actual physical processes. They are often open, over-parameterized, right? We have a quality called equifinality, which means that many different parameters tend to lead to the same results and can match uh, the historical data, but that doesn't mean they will towards uh, uh, in future predictions. And they also will often require continuous manual calibration, or at least the high-end systems that we uh, tend to kind of trust the most will require manual calibration by experts, which can lead them to become incredibly expensive and not scalable. And so the approach uh, uh, that we and several other groups have been taken, uh, taking in recent years has been to, to kind of take a, a significant turn uh, and instead go in the opposite direction uh, of, uh, model of modern machine learning architectures. So specifically, the type of model that we uh, kind of, we think the results have been most impressive so far uh, are LSTMs, which are a type of neural network that is optimized for modeling time series and specifically time series that require a long memory, right? So for example, in hydrologic uh, uh, models require to remember, let's say if months ago, uh, there was more snow that affects what happens right now. So LSTMs are very naturally, a very natural choice uh, for doing this kind of modeling. But really the most important aspect that I wanna kind of share with these models is that there really is pretty much no explicit modeling of the different processes. Instead, we allow the model to uh, estimate the, uh, uh, the different processes on its own. And while, of course, data-driven models uh, have been kind of an option for many years and have often underperformed relative to more process-based models, we think that these modern architectures are showing us some different results that are worth uh, taking note of. So uh, one result that I want to share, and this is work done in collaboration with uh, Frederick Kratzer and Ray Neering and Sepp Hochreiter and several other contributors, um, has shown that when benchmarked across a wide range of basins, this is specifically based on the CAMELS data set in the United States, it's about over 600 uh, uh, different uh, uh, gauge sites across the United States, 
we achieve some very interesting results. So I'll take maybe a minute to go over and broadly say what we are seeing here. So this graph is a comparison of different models across the United States. So each line represents a different model. And you can see here the different uh, ones that, that have been benchmarked. And um, what you're seeing is a cumulative distribution function over the Nash Sutcliffe efficiency coefficient. Um, but for those of you who are not familiar with these terms, all you need to know is lower is better, right? That means we're getting better scores on, uh, uh, on more sites. Um, and here you can see the performance of these new LSTM based models across all these sites. And what we can see is a significant improvement across uh, different sites. And it's also worth mentioning that these benchmarks are compared to when the uh, creators of the original models have benchmarked it themselves. This is not us benchmarking uh, um, the other models that we are competing against. But in addition to quality improvements, there are two other advantages that are a bit harder to see uh, from this graph alone uh, in these kinds of models. Uh, the first is just scalability. Uh, while classical models require kind of continuous calibration and often recalibration uh, to achieve uh, uh, high accuracy, uh, these models have been trained with a single LSTM trained across the full data set. So this is a single click button, a single training. There is no manual calibration in this process, which allows us to scale this to many more locations than was at least convenient in the past. And then the second is generalization. Um, actually, the graph that you're seeing right here is not a fair comparison between these models. All classical models that you've seen originally have been given data for the specific basin that they are being tested on. While the two LSTM models that you're seeing here, these two uh, lines, have had the site that they are tested on hidden from them. All of the results that you're seeing here are for sites that they've never seen data from the site that they are being tested on. Um, and what this means is that this really gives uh, a lot of room for hope for kind of ungaged uh, uh, basin prediction, right? Uh, because this means that we can achieve uh, some level of generalization. Just a caveat, I'm not trying to claim generalization across completely different regions. These are all have been trained in the United States and have seen similar gauges, but there's at least some level of generalization here. Now, this is still a work in progress. We're still working on uh, a lot of improvements to this kind of modeling. Uh, two things that we are particularly focused on right now is one, how to efficiently communicate information between locations across the, uh, 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 across the river network. Uh, and secondly, also combining this kind of shared model transfer learning approach that we've used in the previous slide, uh, but combining that also with per site modeling that will allow the model to specialize more effectively to sites where we do have data. But we think there's a lot of uh, exciting, exciting things going on here. Of course, for these models to be useful in practice, uh, we don't just need to improve kind of academic results. It's no less important to tackle the practical issues that are inherent to real world data and operational systems. Uh, We've done a lot of work in recent years on reducing data latency, detecting and correcting errors in data collection, and increasing the speed and frequency at which these models are run, uh, which is kind of a bit less uh, sexy in, uh, in conferences, but it's critically important uh, for uh, using these models not only in academia, but actually creating change on the ground. And this hard work has allowed us to launch these systems operationally, uh, and currently covering about 75 million people in India and Bangladesh in collaboration, of course, with the Indian Central Water Commission and the Bangladesh Water Development Board. So we've deep dived into the hydrologic model. I wanna move on now to the second component of an actionable flood forecasting system, the inundation model, or sometimes called the hydraulic model. Now, these kinds of models simulate the water's behavior across the floodplain like you're seeing on the screen right now. And this allows us to understand what areas exactly are going to be affected by an upcoming flood. And this means we can identify in advance who needs to be warned of danger, and no less importantly, where they can go to be safe. Now, to the classic way to approach these uh, 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 types of modeling is through finite element solutions to the St. Venant or the shallow water equations. And this is also the kind of first approach that we've taken, implementing our own hydraulic models, which are equivalent in terms of their performance to standard 
uh, models like Hecref and so on, but we've kind of re-implemented them so that we can distribute them efficiently on Google's supercomputers. But right from the start, if you want to scale this thing uh, globally and specifically for the regions that currently have the largest amount of flood-related fatalities and harms, you run into a few challenges very quickly. The first challenge is elevation maps. Uh, these models rely critically on elevation maps, at least if we want highly spatially accurate results. Uh, and in the majority of the world, uh, it's very hard to attain maps that are uh, uh, at high enough a resolution to be effective. And you can see here an example of the simulation of the same river uh, near Hyderabad, uh, but one with one meter resolution and one with 90 meter resolution based on SRTM's uh, elevation maps. And a second challenge is that even if you go through all the work and either purchase or collect data that's relevant to producing an elevation map, uh, especially on a global scale, uh, very quickly you'll find that it becomes out of date uh, because some rivers uh, uh, change at a high rate, and we care about the morphology now, not uh, several years ago, maybe, when we collected the data. And the challenge is that producing these can be expensive, right? One classic way of doing this is through stereographic imagery, where we take uh, multiple pictures uh, uh, of the same location uh, uh, with, let's say, a satellite or a plane. But again, because of these costs, if you want something that is global, it'll be at a low frequency, uh, and so your data will be stale. We've taken a slightly different approach uh, to producing these elevation maps. And instead of using expensive specialized satellite missions, we purchased large amounts of high resolution optical imagery that is captured anyway, every day across the globe. And these are completely standard optical images, no specialized uh, 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 devices or missions required. And what we do is we then do a process that is somewhat similar to serographic imaging. We use the differences between the images to deduce the height on the ground but using these arbitrary images, which is much hard work, ha harder work on the software side, but that allows us to produce these high quality images on an annual basis anywhere we'd like in the world. And here you can see an example of that. This is specifically in the Yamuna River going through Delhi. But that's still not enough. And I wanna share one example maybe uh, that we've, uh, uh, we've run into. What you're seeing here is an evaluation of one of the first alerts we ever sent out uh, and this one was in Patna about two years ago in India. And what you're seeing here in blue is areas that were indeed inundated and we've alerted. In purple, you can see areas that were not inundated but did receive an alert. Uh, the idea was to also warn people who are very close to the inundation. So we felt very comfortable with the purple buffer you can see here. The red blobs are areas that were inundated but did not receive an alert. Um, and that's, of course, a big problem. And we have, most of them are pretty small and rare, except this big annoying blob of red here, which we frustrated us for months because we just couldn't understand it. It didn't make sense physically. There's a huge embankment between the river here and the area that's flooded, and we couldn't understand how that happens. So we ended up flying to Patna and talking to the farmers there. And immediately they told us, oh, of course, when, when, when farmers want to water their fields, uh, then they'll kind of dig holes in the embankment the water surpasses. And this is very obviously something that would be very hard to, for us to know uh, based on satellite data. So we started asking ourselves, well, how, how can we automatically learn this information, right? We want to be able to learn from experience since we do have uh, various types of data, let's say optical imagery and SAR imagery. So we wanted to automatically learn those aspects uh, of the flooding behavior that we don't know a priori from first principles or from the data that we have. And what we've developed is an end-to-end -end machine learning model that correlates the gauge measurements directly to uh, the flooding patterns. Now, this performs far better than physics-based components in areas with data scarcity, when what we, the data we have to work with is pretty limited. But of course, it might not perform well, let's say, in unprecedented events and other uh, challenging circumstances. So, we set out to combine these two approaches uh, and to learn automatically what we don't know. For example, anything that has to do with the riverbed, which at least in the elevation map that we produce doesn't include the bathymetry since it's optically based, while still extending much of that information to the full floodplain using physics-based processes. Um, and this has allowed us to uh, uh, really uh, both improve the accuracy and scale up a lot of our operations. 
Uh, our operational inundation models now cover about 240 million people, and we're working hard to expand them further. Now, I said this is accurate. Uh, I wanted, so here you can see an example, uh, if you look at the bottom here, of another comparison between our forecasts and what ended up uh, happening based on optical and star mm -hmm. imagery. And uh, uh, as you can see, at a 64 meter resolution, we achieve pretty high precision recall, which means that we're usually right about what every 64 meter uh, uh, area on the ground. Of course, this is even more kind of uh, inspiring to see when you look at it in real life. This is when we were uh, uh, in uh, Bihar, India, uh, while flooding occurred. And here you can see kind of our forecast. We're standing right at the edge of where we expect flooding to begin. And as you can see, that is indeed where it happens. Finally, I don't have much time. I just want to quickly mention, uh, of course, none of this is useful if it doesn't reach the right people in the right time. And we use Google's public alert in alerts infrastructure to notify millions of people within minutes of an alert. We can notify them based on existing alerts that we get from governments and disaster management agencies, or based on the models that we just talked about, which we developed and approved in partnership with the relevant governments. Um, we put a strong emphasis on making things visual, providing local information, making them interactive, supporting local languages. And just over the past few months, we've sent uh, active alerts of warning to more than 10 million people. So that was kind of a quick overview of what we think are the most uh, interesting challenges and what we've done so far to try and address them. And thank you all for listening. <laughs>